Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. We are a non-profit organization addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination in waste management by bringing together uh, minds from across the world to build a global waste management community. Today, we are going to talk about the informal waste recycling sector in India. We have uh, Shailendra Singh, who's a founder and CEO of Sustain Mantra, who uh, is moderating this discussion. So speaking to Shailendra are four people. We have two people from Swatch. We have Harshad Barde, who is the director of Swatch Pune. We have uh, Supriya Bhadakwad, who is one of the board members of Swatch. We, uh, have, we also have uh, Siddharth Hande, who is a founder at Kabadiwala Connect. And we have Harain Sanghavi, from, who's a managing director at GMS Plastic Machinery, who will be bringing in the recycler's perspective to this conversation. We received several of your questions along with your registration. Thank you so much for that. They've been passed on to the moderator as well as the panelists. But as usual, we will be taking your questions live. Please put in your questions in the Q&A section, and Shailendra will be taking the questions uh, based on whenever he thinks it's relevant to the discussion. So, yes, all over to you, Shailendra. I will mute myself now. Thank you very much, uh, Shweta, and a uh, very good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be. Uh, uh, we're really uh, looking forward to uh, a good, good next one hour. Uh, the focus of the webinar and discussion is largely on the waste picker, local aggregator, and the informal recycler. That is where the story begins. Uh, you know, as, as most of us in India would know. Um, and, and without, you know, sort of getting uh, uh, too long into an opening speech, I'm extremely, extremely pleased uh, to introduce uh, first uh, Supriya Tai, uh, who is a board member at Swatch, and, and she has been a waste picker uh, for quite, her, uh, quite her, her life and has the unique distinction of actually going to both Paris and uh, uh, and representing India uh, in ILO. So, uh, without further ado, let me hand over to Supriya Thai. Supriya Thai, Namaskar. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, Namaskar. 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 Supriya. Namaskar. Kaise aap? Namaskar. Achoo. Uh, Supriya Thai, you asked me to ask the waste picker ki jo dunia hai, uh, जो काम आप करते हैं पिछले आपने तो बहुत सालों से काम किया है बट uh, कैसे ये आपका जो काम और uh, काम करने की जो पद्धति है वो कैसे बदली हुई है पिछले 5 साल में और आज जब कोविड हुआ है तो इसमें कुछ आपको चैलेंजेस आए हैं क्या फॉर द ऑडियंस फॉर द ऑडियंस हु इज डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी वी विल बी ट्रांसलेटिंग द कन्वर्सेशन आई जस्ट आस्क Supriya Tai about how the lives of the waste picker has changed over the last five years and are there any particular challenges uh, in the last couple of months because of COVID. Uh, ha, Supriya Tai, please. Meena, maji parasthiti maji am lahan pana basta mi yeste, am ja ghara pashis kasra deko hota, ani kasa lahan pana am ji parasthiti chane ne hoti, maza wadil daro peza, ami char lea, char bhain rao ne hoto, ani mang ti purin chana dani, चला वैसा चला वैसा ला मुन्नु सब लग ली ये आमी मंग वैसा ला चला के सो आई स्टार्टेड पिकिंग वेस्ट एस व्हेन आई वाज अ चाइल्ड वी यूज्ड टू लिव राइट नेक्स्ट टू द वेस्ट डेपो हियर इन पुणे एंड शी सेड दैट हर होम वाज क्वाइट टेरिबल हर फादर यूज्ड टू ड्रिंक and she had many sisters and there was no income in the household so along with all her other sisters she used to start she started picking waste at a very young age when she was just maybe ki vachcha se tere me she was just maybe earlier than 10 to 12 years of age okay ah mag am ahit na depo parat ban jala mo me hadap sar deva cha ura jat hote ma hit hit astanas na maaz lagna jale var mag amala hi sudet nahuti ki mana chi tumi yase jana bahar kaade chi loko te karpo chi loko saheb loko ma ami kagat kas कष्ट करी पण जितने सवस झालो फोटो पास काढला आणि त्यांना दाखवला मग ते आम्हाला विसू द्यायला लागले काय की मी माझं मिस्टर भी काम करत नव्हते ना मी मी सतत सतत वेचत होते लेपलच सो आफ्टर शी गॉट मॅरिड शी ऍक्च्युअली शिफ्टेड फ्रॉम द लोकल डेपो टू द मेन लँडफिल व्हिच इज द एरिया इन व्हिच हर हस्बंड यूज्ड टू स्टे एंड कंटिन्यूड पिकिंग वेस्ट ओवर देयर बट ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम द लोकल कॉर्पोरेशन शट आउट एंट्री फॉर द वेस्ट पिकर्स टू एंटर इनटू द लँडफिल 
uh, and that's when she joined the Kagat Arts Patra Kashtagari Panchayat, which is a trade union of informal waste pickers in Pune. Uh, and based on that, they acquired ID cards from the Pune Municipal Corporation, which then allowed them entry into the landfill to continue waste picking. <laughs> so when we used to uh, pick waste at the landfill or on the streets, uh, we faced a lot of problems, especially from the police, who would generally look at us as thieves, as people who are picking waste or stealing stealing things and then putting it for sale. And over a period of time, uh, along with the local corporation and the trade union, uh, we started uh, going door to door to collect waste from the doorsteps rather than collecting from the landfill. Uh, we first started it in Urari Devaji, which is the, where the landfill is located, but eventually they shifted to the inner parts of the city, uh, continuing to collect waste directly from the doorsteps. And her point is that from in, during this transition, the perspective of the citizens towards waste pickers or the way that they viewed waste pickers changed substantially from somebody who was maybe picking waste and could potentially steal from them to someone who was a service provider who was living on waste and not really stealing from people. So once we've started DTDC, uh, once we started providing a doorstep collection service, um, the big difference was that here we started getting a user fee from the citizens. That's what the system is in Pune. The citizen pays directly to the waste picker. And uh, they also get access to the recyclables directly from the doorstep rather than from the landfill or from the streets. And while sometimes the money is actually slightly lesser than what you might get from picking waste, um, you have far higher levels of dignity and better working conditions, access to things like uh, sorting sheds as well. <laughs> So now over the years, we are in a situation where the police, the citizens and all the other people who are within the system actually back us, saying that these are the people who are keeping our city clean and we would like to support them. And if anybody opposes us, the citizens and the system now comes and protects us itself. Um, so uh, she's saying that once the lockdown started, uh, she's giving the, in the current COVID context, the first problem was that they couldn't move around. The police would stop them. So they had to get essential service passes because they provide the doorstep collection service here in Pune. Um, and there was a transport issue because there's no public transport and most waste pickers and workers get to work through public transport. So accessing their place became a problem. Secondly, it was what was more tough was the citizens' uh, behavior, where people who knew them for decades started throwing waste at them from five or six feet away, rather than coming and delivering it into their pushcart or into their vehicle. Um, and it only stopped after they started conversing with the citizens, saying that 
I have a like I'm taking care. I have a sanitizer. I'm going to throw sanitizer and soap water on all the waste that you give. I'm going to wear gloves. You're probably more likely to give it to me than I am to give it to you. Uh, and that's when slowly, slowly, citizens started saying that yeah, I'm there. The risk of their transmission is just as much outside when they go to buy vegetables or go to buy milk as it is with the waste pickers. So there's no point in maintaining that kind of social distance while giving over the waste. And that's one thing that right. we had to overcome talking to people. Yeah. Right. राइट right. uh, तो सुप्रिया uh, ताई uh, mm-hmm. अभी जब आप आगे का सोचती हैं कि अगले चार mm-hmm. पांच साल में तो आपको कैसा लगता है कि क्या सिचुएशन uh, इम्प्रूव होगी uh, आपके एस्पिरेशंस क्या हैं आप आप क्या चाहती हैं लाइफ से कचरा घा ना मै प्रॉब्लम गाड़ीवाला खर मतलब प्रॉब्लम है आम चीज बरबर काम करते नहीं एक भी नहीं काम कर चांगल बोल पाजे ड्राइवर लोक बेगार नागरिक नगर सेवक नगर सेवक सुधा नहीं चांगल बोल तुम्हें लोग नकोस मनते नगर सेवा मे खर मे चांगला बदल चल भंगार बदल आता चार पांच महीने बंद है भंगार जे नागरिक लोग है जी आता है नागरिक ने चांगल बगित नगर सेवक ने भी चांगल बे भंगारत भी भाव वाले खर मैं पांच वर्ष बदल पाजे चांगला She's making three critical points. One is that uh, although they've set up a system which is now which covers most of the city, um, the behavior that they receive from the system, so from the permanent workers of the municipality, from other parts of the system, uh, is still lacking. And they would uh, appreciate it if that kind of changes, workers, them being social workers, would improve from within the system of the municipal corporation also. The second thing is that uh, she says that both the workers as well as the elected representatives, uh, the local elected representatives, uh, and the citizens need to acknowledge and recognize their contribution a little more because what they are doing is finally recycling uh, all the waste in the city. And the third part is about the bhangar or the scrap which they are selling. Uh, she said that for the last five months she has really not been able to sell too much. Um, She's not been able to sell too much waste at all because most of the scrap shops have been closed, and she's hoping that this issue should not occur again. So the prices that they get for their waste should be a little more stable. She should be able to get uh, better rates for the scrap that they are right now putting into recycling. So recognition from society uh, and better rates for scraps are the two critical things that she is talking about right now. Right. So same thing that ident- acknowledgement from the citizens is very critical. सुप्रिया ताई आप आपसे मिलके बहुत अच्छा लगा और सबसे अच्छी बात ये लगी कि जो आप इतनी मेहनत का काम करती हैं और इतने सालों से करती हैं लेकिन आपके चेहरे पे जो हंसी है जो स्माइल है आ, वो शायद हम लोगों में बहुत बहुत लोगों को नसीब नहीं हो तो बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया शुक्रिया आपका आ, आप आए और आप रहिएगा हमारे साथ जैसे ये बात आगे बढ़ाते हैं स्टार्टीज Um, evolving and what, in your opinion, are the key challenges? Um, so, thank you, Shailendra, and she also said thank you. Well, muted myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, the the key challenges are that you know over the last thirty years, almost in Pune, it uh, reaches out to about eight and a half lakh properties every single day, recycling more than two hundred tons. Uh, and there's around three and a half thousand waste pickers who are already integrated into the system. Um, going forward, though, the big challenges are how do we maintain stability of this system? 
Now, uh, you know, this, the model that is there in Pune is one of the cheapest waste collection systems in the world. To the extent that the waste pickers work saves the Pune Municipal Corporation around 120 crores per annum as against any other kind of contractor driven model that could be established. And there are things like direct transparency. When the citizen pays the waste picker directly, uh, there's a relationship that is built beyond boundaries of caste and class and other social barriers that are there. There's also transparency and accountability directly between the service provider and the service uh, recipient. The challenge now is uh, multiple. One is that there needs to be better recognition of such kind of sustainable systems. You know, there's a huge amount of contractualization, good or bad, that happens across the country. But such kind of organizations need to be promoted where the workers themselves are empowered and recognized. And therefore, their rights are primary in the waste management system. Just as because we've all now seen over the last four years that they are extremely essential to all of our lives and our livelihoods. So protection of their livelihoods is critical. Organizations functioning like this need to be promoted more. Um, there is an issue of preservation of livelihoods. As we move ahead, we have more and more mechanization that is being introduced. There are more and more complex materials that enter the waste system uh, that are being introduced. And there are newer policy changes like say extended producer responsibility and newer rules that keep coming out. In all of these, the preservation of the existing livelihoods of waste pickers in the system needs to be recognized. So Swatch has been able to do that for the informal waste pickers in Pune, uh, but we still need to do more. There are 4,000 more waste pickers who are not like her, who are still at the landfill, who are still picking waste on the streets. So they need to be integrated into these systems as well. Um, I think a policy level direction where uh, waste management systems, whether it's through EPR or through ULVs, which kind of empower the individual waste pickers, provide them with the necessary dignity, protect their livelihoods through giving PPE and um, awareness and capacity building, along with empowerment, which allows them to get better access to waste, better money for their recyclables, and preservation and sustainability of their livelihoods, so that they're not threatened every day by some changes in the municipal system. These are the big things that we are looking for over the next four to five years. And just yeah. one last thing is that all these things have been thought about. They're there in law, but they're kind of vague. So the implementation has to match the intention of the policies as well. That I think is something that we all need to work on. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Arshad. Many of those points uh, ring so true. And I always believe that, you know, there's no need to duplicate a system that's so effectively working. But how could you integrate that uh, much like you have done very, you know, very well in Pune? Um, thanks so much for that. And I'll come back uh, to the question you had around policy and what the government can do. But, but let me take the uh, occasion now to move to our next panelist, who is Siddharth Hande, um, uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Kabadiwala uh, Connect. Siddharth is actually a... Siddharth, are you there? I can't see you. Um, no, I'm here. I can, I can, oh, there I you can are. hear you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I can hear you okay. Thanks. Uh, Siddharth is actually a spatial data analyst by training, uh, interested in social entrepreneurship, urban planning, technology. Um, but prior to... Kabadiwala Connect, he was also a consultant in many of the India's premier urban uh, policy and research think tanks. Um, Siddharth, the question to you in the next link in the chain, uh, which is the Kabadiwala or, or the aggregator, um, how do you see, you know, how is that part of the value chain uh, evolved over the last five years, particularly, you know, in the last one or two years when the whole issue of waste management has kind of uh, reached a crescendo, um, uh, particularly with plastics. And what do you see as the key challenges there? So I think, I think see, so again, I just maybe I, I should start by kind of how, how Kabadiwala Connect started. So yes. I, in 2015, I want a, I want a small grant to map the informal waste supply chain. So at the time when I was working in the development sector, I was looking at the literature, the academic literature, and typically when people spoke about the informal sector, there's a lot of focus on the waste picker. Um, and rightly so, there's a lot of issues that, you know, you know, that's right in your face that, that, is, that you need to handle. But I was trying to look at, you know, who are the waste pickers selling to? What is this at scale? You know, there's a world, well, I think it's a, it's a study that says 1% of, of the population is, finds, does waste picking as a full-time activity. So that means in Chennai, where I'm from, that's about 7,000 to 10,000 people. So who are these 10,000 people selling to? What were they selling? You know, you know, how did, how, how is this material from an ecosystem level looking? And so that's my, that was my kind of starting point. 
where I started mapping the small scrap shops in the city and doing this kind of detailed survey. You know, how big is your shop? What type of materials? What are some of your price points? Where do you sell it to? And we started mapping these guys in the city. It was really fascinating. We found 2,000 small scrap shops uh, and we found 200 larger aggregators. And together, that ecosystem was responsible for procuring over 100,000 tons of material every year. So that's, that's about 20, 25% of uh, Chennai's recyclable volume. Really fa you know, fascinating. Paper is, a, is really important. Metal is really important. And this plastics was kind of like now becoming a big, uh, you know, PET was, was the mature market. But now, again, you know, there's this new kind of like demand for PP, PE, the flexibles. So <clears throat> from that perspective, we felt that these small scrap shops and larger scrap shops, of course, you know, because of the informal nature of the supply chain, there are a lot of inefficiencies. There's, there's a lot of uh, issues in, in compliance and health and safety. But the way the supply chain looked was a very decentralized, robust kind of supply chain. So we started asking the question, okay, Okay, what does it take to convert these guys or something that you know we're looking to do is like not to collect in such terrible conditions and one of the things that we found you know was to, to basically work with the kabadiwala shop and get the waste pickers who are loyal to him or her to go and do neighborhood collection and we built some technology to kind of do traceability you know to kind of enable you know smart logistics these kinds of things but it's playing on the same idea that we, you know that Hashid was saying, which is chain, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really fascinating elements about the supply chain that can be leveraged for, you know, the kind of ambitions that we have in this sector. Yeah. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Siddharth. That was really, really nice. And, you know, one thought uh, when I uh, heard what Harshad was, uh, and Swatch has done, and what you have done, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk, uh, you know, I hear about um, uh, plastic and uh, you know, in the tonnage of waste made, etc. But very little actually on the ground tracking. You know, much like you have done in Chennai and Harshad's team has done in Pune. You know, what such a nice thing it would be if you could do this all over India. You know, and really get down to data. A lot of emotions yeah. right now, less data. You know. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I really, I really. I mean, you can't manage what you don't measure. I mean, I think that that's a really absolutely. important. Absolutely. That's a Absolutely. really important point. And, and, you know, there is at least, you know, so we, we submitted a response to the EPR draft. And one of the things that we acknowledged was, you know, the, the, there, was a, there was a kind of like aspiration to go beyond the heuristic of the waste paper in that discussion. Right. And there's also this kind of perspective of, you know, we want a baseline. We should, you know, this waste right. management authority should be responsible to do a baseline. So I think for, from our perspective, what we really believe is like, we, we need to develop some standards around what this baseline is going to be. Exactly. You know, right now, exactly. you know, it's really important to account for everything that is in play, how it's in play before you then kind of like take the next step. Because the fear that everybody has now is like, you know, you're going to do a lot of harm by trying to move something if you don't understand how all the parts work together. Absolutely. And particularly because of COVID, you know, there's a lot more plastic waste coming into the system. And, and again, there are figures being quoted, but I don't see any well uh, uh, articulated reports or studies done on the ground. Uh, thanks so much, Siddharth. Moving on, uh, allow me to introduce Harain Sangweji, who is the Managing Director of GMS Plastic Machinery. And under his guidance, uh, GMS has been manufacturing a whole range of recycling machines, uh, washing plants, ancillary machines, uh, also under a joint venture with Gamma Mechanica of Italy. And uh, he's released various technical articles and he has spoken at so many uh, uh, functions and associations, uh, uh, technical papers where uh, with, with organizations like IPMA, Plast India, India Plastic Institute, so on and so forth. Um, and Harin Bai is probably closest uh, to the next person in the value chain, which is the informal recycler. Harin Bai, in, you know, and I'm talking about the recyclers that are under the radar, right? They are, they are not registered, they've been operating uh, sort of uh, in a, in a uh, you know, uh, uh, invisible manner, but uh, addressing the issue of waste. So how has their life changed in the last five years? What do you see are the challenges there? You know, what, how, how has COVID impacted them? What are the challenges in that space? 
Thank you, Shailendra. Uh, thank you, Shweta, too. Um, yeah, uh, see, uh, talking about recyclers and the current scenario, or uh, I mean, I'll split it into two parts. First is the yeah. pre COVID situation. Um, the pre COVID situation and the post COVID situation were not really very far apart. The only difference now and then was the price difference between the polymer. Uh, uh, um, base polymer and uh, and the recycled waste. Now, uh, coming to the situation about regulations, uh, pre-COVID, the regulations last three, four years have been very stringent. Mm -hmm. uh, companies have been locked down because of uh, non-performing regulations. But still, you will see that all those who were shut down have come back to work, but are not registering themselves. This is something which is which is a chaotic situation as far as India goes in the recycling sector. Uh, I have seen that nearly 90% of the recyclers who are uh, in the MSME sector are still not registered. And this is not a good sign. And this oh. is not a um, something has to be done by the government, by the by the policy makers to make it simple and easy for them to register and uh, get their things done. Proper infrastructures, uh, I, I would say there are at least uh, 35, 40 zones, big zones, recycling zones, like for example, I'll give you Malegao in India, uh, which are uh, one of the biggest hubs, Jalgaon, uh, of recycling. Um, but uh, unfortunately, those are the areas which are still not getting registered because uh, of pollution issues which uh, they are facing. And uh, unfortunately, no governmental support in the form of infrastructures which need to be provided uh, for water and air pollution, especially for water pollution because that's a major criteria under which they are not being able to register themselves. So mm. those are the things which really need to be attended. Understand. And, and you know, whilst I understand the need for having, uh, you know, proper process controls and stuff, uh, you know, at one hand, if you have the waste lying untreated, it's causing probably more harm. And, and so sometimes I feel that, you know, we try to achieve perfection uh, from the from the word go, and we all know, you know, in this country, you can't go from zero to hundred. You got to go from zero to twenty to sixty. Hopefully, we can go to zero to hundred, but I don't think we are uh, we are at that uh, at that point yet. The one common thing that I heard all of you say was, you know, government and policy and and things. And this is a a pet peeve for me. So let me let me go back to Harshad and ask you a question, Harshad. <clears throat> um, Harshad? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. So, you know, we, we've all heard about this, right? The government should do this, the policy should say this, etc. But we all know that probably in this whole chain, the most ineffective um, people are the, the bureaucrats and the policy makers. Uh, somehow there seems to be a disconnect uh, between what's going on in the ground <clears throat> excuse me, and what's going on in the uh, power corridors and their understanding of the realities on the ground. So, and most of us know that despite the bureaucrats and despite the regulations, somehow this country, you know, just tends to function. So if, if my question to you was, what can we do in spite of the bureaucracy? Not, you know, of course they have to play their role, but, uh, through hard uh, experience, we know that you know by the time they get it right, uh, the the value chain would have already figured it out. So what can we do? I mean, government policy and input is is one part, but aside of that, what would you say is required? <clears throat> um, so, of course, I mean, although you say despite that, I would say that the first thing <laughs> is for those who believe that the policies need to be changed to approach yeah. the government and them and change uh, the policy. Uh, Harin, 
Jeevan uh, remember that many years ago we met uh, Delhi when the solid waste management and plastic waste management rules were being drafted. I think I'm speaking to him for the first time after that. And I don't think that there is too much of a lack of understanding at government level. People understand it. Bureaucrats have okay. for decades. They know what is going on, but there are compulsions because of which things don't happen, or there are directives because of directions in which the policy needs to go because of which things don't happen. Now, despite that, if we want to do uh, each player uh, can look at some base principles to follow. Um, all of us, when we get down to the minutiae, we'll have different perspectives on this technology, that technology, burn, don't burn, whatever, you know, plastic growth is good, is bad, whatever. Uh, but let's look at some of the simple things that we can do, especially with respect to the informal sector. One, we know that it exists and that it is strong. So like yeah. Mr. Harim said, ki humne, uh, we should try and integrate the existing system as much as possible. Like Siddharth also talked about this point and what we are also doing. That you look at the system, so if the waste pickers are already picking the waste, let's do basic training with them and let ensure that they get a better rate for their material and they get integrated into the system. People like Siddharth can come help uh, with the data aspects of it. Uh, people like uh, Mr. Sangvi can help by saying, like one, by providing data that, you know, uh, these Malegaon is one sector where a lot of informal uh, recycling happens. The other important thing is to also bring about a, to have a perspective change towards things. Informal does not mean illegal, you know, and informal yeah. is not bad, even though it has been- Great like, point, yeah. In circles has been thought of as being bad, but it's also, it is the way that it is. And, uh, you know, a lot of the recycling happens through it. So uh, when we look at informal recyclers or informal scrap shops or informal waste pickers, mm -hmm. we need to ask, how do we preserve these livelihoods and how do we strengthen them further? So if the yeah. recyclers are using poor technologies, can we then try and work with them to provide them access to easier technology? A lot of the times, I mean, nobody wants to burn these. A lot of the times if they have access to better technology, it will help. If we open source the uh, R&D that is happening with basic extrusion technology and make it available to people uh, at a cheaper cost, that can really work out. Uh, if we look at what, so again, what Siddharth is saying, that you look at creating networks and connections and handing it over to the industry itself and letting them letting them work out better ways, better logistics. I mean, all of us know if we try to start collecting all the recyclables centrally through a massive mechanism, we will all fail because the informal sector is far flexible. They, uh, they, they, they may cut corners sometimes, but they also turn really quick on corners. You know, they, they yeah. go fails. Um, so these are the things that we need to look at. Look at the existing systems, strengthen it further, invest in people mm -hmm. who are in it, preserve their livelihoods and upgrade them more. And the yeah, policy yeah. is there for doing this, uh, yeah. but it's big and there are gaps. So when we fill in the gaps, we should be filling it to strengthen the sector and formalize it, but while preserving livelihoods and not by Got reducing them. Got you. There was, a, there was a question from the audience also on similar lines. So I hope uh, you know that is answered. And, and one would assume that when you integrate them into the sort of formal uh, supply chain, that that will also help improve the quality of life uh, for everybody in the value chain. And clearly one can see that there are areas where there could be co-learning opportunities, right? If the waste is segregated in, uh, properly, then the recycler has a chance to recycle and make something out of it uh, of value. I mean, uh, we all know source segregation is an issue. Um, Siddharth, in your case, uh, same question for the Kabadiwalas. Um, you know, I remember uh, everyone knows of a Kabadiwala coming home and collecting newspaper and we thought, you know, this was probably a one man, one family operation. What can we do to better organize them, um, you know, and make them more effective in the, in the value chain? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I just want to share maybe like a COVID story about the Kabadi, some of the Kabadi Walas we've been working with in Chennai. So, yeah. you know, I mean, one of the, one of the big issues was all the recycling plants shut off, you know, and, yeah. and when they shut down, you know, there's a, there's a big issue because you have waste pickers who are living on daily wage. You have the scrap shop who's not suddenly making any money. But what we, what we actually saw was just because they had to, they were giving the, Kabad, the, the waste pickers money every day to get food. Uh, they were saying, okay, you'd go and try to collect what, what you can. Uh, then you, then you, so you're seeing this very complex entanglement between the waste pick and the kabadiwala because they depend on each other for, for their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's mm -hmm. a really interesting way of understanding resilience. You know, the kabadiwala is a shop owner who has some capital stored away, who's able to take this shop. It's quite, you know, I'm not saying that it was a good story all around, but they were amazingly resilient 
during this time. I think the big issue is the disconnect between the formal and informal supply chain where, where the Kabadiwala is basically existing under the shadow of the inadequacy of the formal system to collect segregated waste. And therefore, right. the basic tension is if the formal mm. system manages to do this segregation, then what's the role of this scrap shop? Right. But, right. but, 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 but so, and again, you know, the other issue kind of like pushing this is like, you know, these contracts are very expensive, very long term. So if a municipality or ULB gets locked in into the wrong kind of contract with no KPIs around segregation, then, I mean, you're looking at eight years of, of, of you, everybody's locked into something bad. You know what I mean? So I think that that, that has this, this lack of understanding of the informal supply chain the last time. So you take again, e-waste, there was no real kind of in, engagement with the informal sector, which, which basically meant the informal sector outcompeted on the collection of certain e-waste and processed it very bad, you know? So I think, I hope now with the plastics <coughs> mandate that's come in, you're going to see a more formal role for, for the Kabadiwalas and their waste pickers. You know, Kabadiwalas are not just one-man operations. There are a few of them, but there are also a lot who waste pickers come every day and sell to, who they've built a loyalty yeah. with. Uh, you know, who yeah. they've given money. There's, there's very complex relationships over there. Yeah. So I think for those folks to actually organize neighborhood collection and these small aggregators making sure that the material is going to the right place, they become essentially local, you know, waste collection managers. I think that that's, a really exciting future for everyone in future. Europe. Thanks, thanks, Adar. And and similarly, Harin, by the informal, the uh, the clusters that you talked about, um, of course, you know the government needs to approve and maybe form a uh, give them approval and stuff. But aside of that, I mean, these guys are doing some great work. What else is needed to you know kind of bring them into uh, the mainstream. I think Siddharth made a very interesting point, like the informal sector is working in the shadows of the formal sector. How do we throw light there and remove these shadows in the system? Uh, basically, when we talk about uh, uh, getting the informal sector into the formalization, uh, mm -hmm. first comes the policy, as Harshad and myself and Siddharth also pointed out in certain uh, form. First is the policy, of course, then the infrastructure. There has to be certain infrastructures provided, especially in the plastic zones where uh, these people are situated. And finally, the recyclers need to upgrade to newer technologies, faster machines, higher production machines to get into the formalization. Because at the moment, what they are facing is they're facing a price constraint because they are not able to compete with the newer generation equipment man, uh, from which the material is being recy recycled yes. and sold. And uh, simultaneously, they are facing the um, policy issues which uh, at, at any given time stop them from production and again they are back into production. So they should actually think of formalizing and at that, some, at that stage, I think various recycling associations can be formed, maybe cluster-wise. And uh, uh, those associations can take up the, the matters of the particular zone and try mm. to formalize them and at any given cost. Mm. Someone has to take the lead to formalize. Yeah. And that yeah. would be an ideal win-win situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you again uh, there. And I think you made a good point, Arin, by, you know, these clusters are there and you don't need, uh, you could have, for example, a common ETB plant, right? That in many industrial cases, industrial cities, so, uh, you know, it, it escapes uh, many of us. Uh, these are not rocket science. Uh, these can be done. And, uh, you know, there has to be a will to do it. So thanks uh, for giving, you know, giving, a, uh, throwing some light on that. Uh, part of the value chain. We are coming about uh, to 20 minutes left and I want to make sure that I'm taking questions from the audience. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me uh, let me go back uh, and, you know, uh, hit on a few uh, touchy points that we don't normally talk about. And this question is for you, Harshad and Siddharth. And also a similar question, I, I think, was uh, in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, how prevalent is the occurrence of illegal dumping by the informal sector? I mean, 
do you do you see that uh, uh, you, you know and what what percentage of the waste is kind of handled uh, by the informal sector these are things we normally don't talk about it is there uh, you know the uh, illegal dumping and and things so what in your opinion is is the, uh, is the reason for that um, so i'll i'll respond with respect to the collection part of it and siddharth could go to the scrap sure. shops part of it sure. um, in our experience the the waste pickers don't really dump i mean if anything they're yeah. picking up from the dumps whether it's a landfill or the streets or the road sides or the river sides that's right um, waste pickers were integrated into the collection system also tend not to throw waste because they are a part of this chain where they are passing on the waste to someone else while they are retaining some of the recyclables themselves if you go up the ladder and again say that's the expert on this perhaps and mr harin can give better idea but even as you go up the chain what gets dumped perhaps is the uh, is the rejects all along the chain mm. so the waste mm. kind of the rejects yeah. the informal waste pickers have zero rejects because they only pick up whatever is recyclable and they pass it on the scrap mm. shops get Filtration has come from the waste pickers. They get some level, and then as you go on, the amount of rejects actually reduces. So the illegal dumping, in that sense, I would suspect does not really hap uh, happens, but it does not happen at the scale that we see. What we visually see are citizens dumping, and the formal and informal contractors who are doing waste collection and waste transportation that are actually dumping, dumping. waste, whether it's <laughs> or river sides yeah. or in the landfill. Um, so I can see. Nothing. So I hope he's uh, agreeing with me completely. <laughs> good point. Uh, those who have, like he pointed out, one thing that those, if you have a tonnage-based contract, um, yeah. you tend yeah. to the idea is that you pick up everything and you take it and you dump it somewhere. But that's yeah. what happens. You pick up everything, including recyclables. You mix everything. You put some construction and demolition waste. You put in the e-waste, the wet waste, the sand, the water, everything, and then you dump it somewhere. Even if it is legal dumping in that sense, as you're taking it to the landfill, is the most environmentally unfriendly thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, might as well not pick it up. Let it let it be dumped, and the waste takers will remove some material. Sorry, I'll, I'll pass it on to Siddharth. No, 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 Siddha, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I agree. I mean, I think we should talk about the real culprits of uh, who is illegally dumping, <laughs> which are the the waste collect, you know, the way you know the waste uh, collection guys who have these contracts, and it, it, it's a reality. It's a it's a bad contract. Per ton model, you know, plastic is a high volume, low weight kind of material, you know. So this this sets up the wrong kind of incentives. When it comes to the informal sector, there is a problem. So, for example, when you take PET, now the cap is PP. There's some value there. The bottle, there's value there. The label sometimes is an issue. So, but it's a small percentage, you know, let's say five percent, eight percent of like what the overall feedstock is. And again, like it, it's very hard to kind of, it's it's rather a, a missing environment. to manage that 8% of volume rather than i would you know quote and quote illegal kind of a dumping issue which is you know the, is, there is a essential service that that scrap shop is actually doing the goal is aggregation okay you know you the, the processor maybe can't accept that label or something like that so it's more of a it's more of a missing environment so i wouldn't i would be hesitant to classify it as like illegal dumping although there is a strong environmental implication you know so yeah. you know for example that label over time accrues a lot you don't want to go to the landfill and pay the landfill fee you find you know closest uh, water body or something like that so it. it's a, it's an extra cost to actually manage those rejects so so you know it's it's more incentive issues i think but you know again chennai you know again when we take it you know we generate 5000 6000 tons of waste every every day and most of that material is going to our landfills palikarna and kudengur which are marshlands you know and they're like very like it's very it's a very bad climate of how that material is being dumped over so i think that that's the bigger yeah. issue yeah this there was also one more question from the audience and i wanted to make sure that i got it in and that was related to you know what can uh, academic institutions or research institutions you know what kind of research can they do needy research what sort of direction uh, should these needy research and harin bhai i'll come to you next because you know i think uh, we've heard uh, you know about epr and your views on epr particularly as it relates to plastics but but before that harshad and siddharth um what what's your you know advice for the direction for needy research by academics and research institutions um so there are all three aspects of I mean, the three critical aspects of waste and informality that needs to be looked at 
um, there's a social aspect of who is actually doing this work, uh, what are their working conditions, what are the impacts on their lives, their health and their livelihoods because of the kind of waste that's entering, because of the conditions that they're in. Um, there is a social research aspect very much required to recognize that we still have a, a, an unspoken class slash caste system that is very much prevalent because the workers in this sector are all coming from those backgrounds. And where does that link up? And so that, and also what are the issues that women face? Uh, so, you know, we, we may all be talking about waste, but a woman who goes to pick waste, she doesn't know what to do with her child because there is no access to any kind of childcare, much worse in COVID, for example. So these aspects of why children at the landfill, people are not bringing them, I mean, they, some may bring them by choice, but a lot yeah. of them are there, no other infrastructure to take care of them. So there is a social aspect of it. From the, uh, from the livelihood aspect of it, we need research, better investment in actually enumerating the informal sector much, much better. We really don't know how many waste pickers are out there, how many scrap shops are there, and a lot of investment and work is required in enumerating, and thereafter registering and putting forth their information to the government so that the policy that says that we need better registration and uh, benefits to be given to this workforce are actually brought into play. And the Thanks. Th Sadhanti, wanted to add the environmental and, sorry. Uh, sorry, the environmental and financial impact of the informal sector, and it gets bandied about quite a bit that money is saved and there is good impact on recycling. I think much more in-depth uh, research is still required in that field. Okay, thank you so much. Siddharth, you wanted to add a quick comment? Yeah, sure. I just very quickly, you know, I get very excited about this kind of question because like, I think that, you know, India kind of inherited these legacy waste management systems from Western cities. You know, the way it was financed is a very centralized approach to waste management and it's very expensive. Like, you know, I think waste management, actually the collection of it and the management of it is in crisis all across the world ever since, you know, ever since like China you know, stopped subsidizing basically the recycling market. Everybody's questioning, why is it so expensive? How do we do it? And I, and I think for me, you know, the informal supply chain, it's decentralized nature. I think that that's really, really exciting. So I would say that there's two things that we need to do. We need to go back to this idea of integrated solid waste management as a heuristic. We need to collect the data on the informal supply chain and then say from an ISWM perspective, how do I optimize my collection, my aggregation and my processing? And that's something from a theoretical lens, if a lot of folks start doing, I think it would be very, very powerful. Uh, thanks, uh, Siddharth. Coming, uh, Arin Bhai, you're muted, but uh, quick question. You wanted to say something, Arin Bhai? Yeah, actually, I wanted to add here. Um, yeah. In fact, when I was saying policy um, amendments, I was also looking at simplification. It's just not right. amending the policy to um, uh, be acceptable by the industry, but simplification would also help uh, all these issues which are uh, cre being created. Right. So, so again, and, and stay, staying on that one, uh, Harain Bhai, your view, you know, there are a lot of questions on whether EPR can uh, help, uh, you know, bridge the gap and uh, get the funding. What are your views on EPR, particularly as it relates to plastics and, um, you know, what that could contribute in sort of throwing light between the formal and informal sector that we talked about? Yeah, see, my my take on EPR is, you know, uh, basically, I look at it as an overall picture. I don't look at it from the plastic perspective itself. If the government really wants to do something in relation to EPR, their attention should be across the board. It's not only the plastic sector which needs to be attended. It should mm. be the steel or the paper or the metal or the wood industry, which should be part of the whole gambit. Secondly, mm. my in, uh, impression was, in fact, initially when we were doing the PWM, myself, Harsha, then we were, many of us were doing the PWM, we were, uh, we in fact enforced EPR. And when we enforced EPR, our intent and our clear indications were that it should be across the board of the total industry. It should not mm. be just the producers or just the brands, but everyone across the board. It could be importers, it could be uh, manufacturers of raw materials, it could be every single person who should be involved <clears throat> in the yeah. complete EPR sector. And the most important is 
when you talk about epr see brands are the ones who are putting the big product in the market but they, those packaging are made by small msms who cannot afford to do such epr activities and for them the ideal situation would be to have an epr system wherein you pay the pay a pro or a or a or a recycling institution some funds towards the epr activity and they would do the complete epr and the circular economy process for the producers who are a small manufacturer so this is where we have been talking about across epr yeah. do you do you harin bhai in your experience or harshad uh, anyone in the panel uh, how do you see the current pros based in india engaging with the informal sector or waste picker are there good examples there or um, not really frankly they have not been able to really put themselves into work when they were given the permissions i think within a month they were withdrawn so by right. the time they could really go into processing or do something mm-hmm. they were really put out of the game so we have not been able to analyze their working really i i think harshad may be able to put more light on it but uh, when we are talking of pros yes it would be a good idea because they would be a a, a group which would assist the msmes to do the complete recycling process from collection to segregation and then putting it into the recycling and create a zero uh, waste economy but right. they need to be allowed to work to uh, know the situation correct right and and uh, you know we are coming close to the hour and there are a lot of questions that have come and uh, you know there's one question i particularly liked and this is to you harshad uh, you know how do you um, how do you take care of child rights and uh, you know in the in the informal sector and what kind of work has swach done in that area can you give us a you know a little quick uh, answer on that sure so sure. so uh, in pune we all been uh, i i i hazard a guess and say that almost stopped uh, most labor in pune anyone who's a part of the organization uh, simply can't engage in it at all uh, but it's been like a de- two decades worth of work you know it's it's about uh, you have to awareness as to why not to bring a child but the minute you do that you come across as someone who does not understand why the child child is there so engaging with the sector is very important because then you find out that we lack child care facilities a lot of mm. people who come are single mothers who don't yeah. know what to do with that and so the children come along a lot of the times access to schools is very difficult um how do you actually bring about is that you have to organize the workers uh, and negotiate and discuss with the workers who are actually engaging in the field because they are the only ones who can convince the other workers to not bring their children along they are your first uh, information system who can alert saying that oh this child is coming uh, and this child is coming because she knows where to go or this child is coming because she is being made to work um yeah. engaging with the community convincing them about uh, child rights issues and also after that really using that organizing power to uh, work with the government to ensure that the basic social facilities are made available to the poor because um, right. there is no other reason as to why anyone uh, would not want to send their child to um, yeah. you know get themselves and get out of the cycle of uh, poverty that they exist in themselves Got and uh, thanks you know because the previous question was with respect to pros i think epr can also be used for some kind of things like this where some Absolutely. of the money doesn't have to be put into recycling material because we'll soon run out of them if everybody is a 100% target we're not going to be able to achieve it <laughs> yeah, yeah. we yeah. need to help the informal sector to uh, mobilize them to assist them in social welfare and other aspects which a company can then also claim as having impacted the sector in yeah. even if it doesn't fit within the uh, uh, you know credit system right one question thanks so much harshad one question siddharth for you from the audience has been uh, how can ulbs integrate informal sector in resonance to the investments in mrf and recovery center infrastructure i think the question is more about integrating them into the ulbs the uh, and what i am presuming here is the waste picker the kabadi wala instead of operating outside the ulb they kind of come under the ulb um uh, umbrella yeah I, i mean yeah i think there are different ways to do that but, but i think that one of the first thing that the ulb 
has to do is, you know, they have to be accountable for some kind of census of how the informal supply chain works. So that there is this body of evidence on how something, you know, how, how it works in a ward. Typically, a ULB is looking at allocating infrastructure at a ward level. So, you know, 50,000 people, 100,000 people kind of a perspective. And I think that one way, one really exciting way, and I, again, I just want to give an example now. In Chennai, for example, the, the conservancy officers are encouraged to sell their recyclables on their way to the resource recovery center or transfer station <laughs> to make a little bit more money. You know what I mean? It is something yeah. that they say, yeah, you know, try to bring as little as you can. You are, you're not, we're not giving you that much money. You're free to make. You know, there's a very entrepreneurial kind of mindset, at least, you know, that we saw in Got Chennai. But they're me. saying you're turning a blind eye. They, you know, they don't, they don't want to address this health and safety. There's, you know, something more complex there. So I think, mm. for example, one of, the, one of the things that we have seen when we do some modeling, if you work with the waste pickers and scrap shops to organize municipal collection of a ward, it can help mm. bring down the operational cost of collection by as much as 20%. So I think right. that that's, I think, very exciting and a good impetus for a waste collection company to say, you know what, let's look at who's there and let's see how we can adopt them for this last mile collection. Then the contract with the waste management company and the, and the municipality stays, but this is a kind of way that you can see this kind of large scale integration because the waste collection company will get a mandate for, you know, 30 wards or 40 wards or something like that. So, you know, a KPI in the, in the EPR, which says, yeah, you know, I'll give you money, but you have to show me that you've done a baseline that you have work to integrate. Then you're going to get some premium to do this. I think that those are all really interesting ways of scaling integration of, of Kabadiwalas and their waste pickers. Okay. Thanks, Shadar. Thanks. Uh, Harin Bhai, one quick question to you. Um, how much of plastics as a fraction of the total plastics collected is actually recyclable? And a second question uh, is, you know, what can you do for recycling MLPs? You know, MLPs is another favorite topic. Uh, and what kind of recycling technologies exist to address MLPs? Um, yeah, it's a multi uh, question. Yeah, uh, let's say uh, what is not recyclable. I think there is no plastic which is not recyclable unless, yeah, you can talk about the new generation um, bio plastics which are still yeah. not tested for recycling. But otherwise, the, the older generation plastics, which are the general plastics category, are recyclable. Then when we come to MLP, yes, MLPs today have various recycling technologies. In fact, you can even make pallets out of it. But the utility of those pallets should be determined well in advance to understand the applications and then recycling done. Or I, alternate techniques are there where you can make profiles or, or different products directly from waste, uh, yeah. from the MLP waste, like uh, um, WPC profiles or non-WPC, just plastic profiles or even the paper blocks, uh, which are very popular in Europe. Um, those sort of sectors can be identified, even Africa for that sake. Uh, paper blocks are very popular. They mix it with sand and they make uh, paper blocks. So those, those provisions are there. People need to identify. They need to really government. Uh, I come back to the government again and again, because these are some sectors which have needing higher investments. And at the, such a stage, government involvement would be ideal to subsidize mm -hmm. those investments at some stage to, mm -hmm. to, to make the uh, project economical and viable. So right. those sectors are available. Um, what was your third question? Can you come back? No, on the, on the MLP and what are there some specific technologies that yeah. can... Uh, yeah. As I told you, there are many technologies, of course, uh, Polymer to fuel and polymer to energy is one of them, but that is end of life situation. If you really right. want to recycle and use, reuse, then we have these profile manufacturing systems which are most popular. Otherwise, right. recycling is possible. Okay. All right. Great. So, may I just, in the interest of time, we are right on the hour right now. Uh, a quick, uh, you know, closing comment, Harshad. Uh, Siddharth and then Harin Bhai in that sequence. I, it's a it's a big subject to cover it in one hour is going to be very difficult. Uh, but if you if you had a last word on this, 
I wish we could go on for another hour, but unfortunately, um, sure. not so much uh, time. Yeah. I mean, one. But Harinji and me should be talking often and not I mean, not like this because these three <laughs> sectors, yeah, need to need to be converged together. We need to have better synergies, and um, if. Uh, Absolutely. have government on board together working some things out, we'd have better EPR policies, we'd have better uh, plastic management policies. Um, I think it's important to look at the sector today because of two very important things. One is the Swaj Bharat Abhiyan, which for all of its good intentions is going, is, is ensuring that there is a lot of waste collection that is happening. Uh, and if in that process, the informal waste pickers and the scrap trader and the recyclers are not integrated to that system, uh, we face uh, uh, you know a lot of employment. Uh, we already have employment issues. We'll have a large section of uh, informal sector being left out of the new employment that being created. So I think preservation of livelihoods through the Swachh Abhiyan and through all the other things that are happening right now with respect to whether it's uh, COVID waste management or uh, solid waste management in general, EPR needs to be of primary importance. Knowing very well that this will ensure the highest level of efficiency at the lowest amount of cost while preserving the maximum number of livelihoods. This must yeah. be critical and for that all sectors need to come together and have that vision in mind. Wonderful. Siddharth, quick word from you. Yeah, I, I think for, for me, um, I feel that this whole push, this public demand to kind of end plastic waste and this big, this big movement around it is a very important moment for this large struggle of integrating the informal sector in the developing world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that if we focus on enumeration, collecting, understanding how the infrastructure works, and I think digitalizing the material flows, I think that that's mm -hmm. going to be a really big driver for informal sector integration. So that's something that I'm really excited about. I, I hope that we use this moment to really look at building decentralized waste management efficient systems, something that, you know, the Indian example can be a showcase and circular economy, economy to the world. You know, I, I believe that there is a model here that everybody should look at around how, how they've kind of figured out, you know, managing this waste that, that should shine around, you know, a circular economy story. So that's, that's my conclusion. Absolutely. Thanks, Siddharth. Harin Bhai, quick word from you. You're muted, Harin Bhai. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. go ahead. Okay. Um, see, I'm happy to hear from Harshad that uh, it's a good situation that uh, uh, the industry and, and the government should sit together. But, you know, there has to be also a situation where proper transparency should be available. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when we, if you really see the situation why PWM did not succeed, is that whatever we had both together, in fact, a lot of people together created the policy, did not really materialize. It came as a completely, uh, I would say not completely, but a lot different from what really was discussed and studied. Discussed. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, mm -hmm. When it happens like that, you know, I understand that government has a various stages which through through which it has to pass the vetting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All that after having done that, there should be a group discussion before being placed to the public for an opinion, so that whatever has been discussed and finalized should be properly channelized and placed. And accordingly, industry can be prepared to uh, use, utilize it. Oh, and yeah. No, thanks, Arun Bhai. Uh, quickly, I think the, you know it's a it's a big subject. Uh, can't cover it in one hour, but I, I must thank the panelists for doing excellent and kind of staying on the topic. Uh, clearly, the uh, to me as I see it, the discussions are happening, and I think uh, all the panelists made a great point that if the stakeholders sat on one table and kind of ironed out the uh, co-learning opportunities in the value chain, one could create more value out of the waste. And that would not only help uh, the players in the segment, but also send a message you know, to the government and to the policymakers that the informal sector can also you know, make this 
uh, into a into a very viable proposition for handling waste. So my uh, thank you so much uh, for for all the panelists. Let me hand it over to Shweta for her closing comments. Thank you, audience as well. Thank you, thank you, Shailendra. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Supriya ji. Thank you, Harshad. Thank you, Harian, and thank you, Siddharth. It was a very good discussion. I think, uh, which sort of gave the we gave it was a good perspective on the entire chain. Although we were not yeah. able to respond to all the questions, we yeah. hope we will be able to get the responses from the panelists and put it up when we share this uh, webinar on the website. So uh, thanks a lot to the audience. Uh, if you haven't signed up to our newsletter, please sign up to it. We have two more panels scheduled in the month of August itself. Another panel focusing on Asia on chemical recycling opportunities in Asia is also pending. So do sign up and uh, do head to our website and you will be able to see it. And uh, Shailendra had also taken part in another panel on Be Waste Wise. You can go to the video panel section and you will find it where he talks about Thank EPR uh, in a little more in depth. So thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Supriya Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.